get into Epicurean physics. And what I've got here is a bare outline with hardly any references of the main points I want to make. So, as usual, interrupt me at any point in time if you want to ask a question about what I'm saying, or even if you just want to direct my attention to a related point or question that you had arising from the readings. Okay? Now, like the other Hellenistic schools, Epicurean philosophy divides essentially into logic, physics, and ethics. But the Epicureans really downplay the importance of logic, and they consider it essentially a part of physics. Um, and they even rename it to a Greek word, canon, or canonic, which means something like the standard or measure. And they think that we don't need to get too much into logic, and we certainly need, don't need to be focusing on things like rhetoric and that sort of thing. All we need to do is come up with some standard or measure by which we can discern what's true from what's false, and by which we can discern reasoning and arguments that will relieve, of, re, relieve, of, relieve us of anxiety and give us tranquility. Now, um, physics, they actually take to be the starting point of the philosophy, and ethics is the end of the philosophy, both in the pedagogical sense and in the sense of the point of doing physics. So, in their view, there is no point in doing physics, and certainly no point of doing logic, which is a mere subdivision of, ethic, uh, of physics, unless it has some positive ethical outcome. So, look at these radical statements of Epicurus, like this one. Empty is the argument of the philosopher by which no human disease is healed. And the word I've translated there, human disease, could, we could say human pathology or even just human suffering there. So empty is the argument of the philosopher by which no human suffering is relieved. <clears throat> just as there is no benefit in medicine if it does not drive out bodily diseases, so there is no benefit in philosophy if it does not drive out the disease of the soul. Okay, so if getting into this logic and physics does not allow us to get rid of mental illnesses, suffering, pathology, human disease, and diseases of the mind, then it's worthless and should not be pursued. It's only if it does have such an ethical effect that it should be pursued. And specifically, with respect to physics, if our suspicions about meteorological and astronomical phenomena, suspicious meaning things that we can become superstitious about and think that Zeus is causing thunderbolts and Poseidon is sending storms and things like that, or that God created the whole universe or something like that, if we didn't have those kind of suspicions about those kind of phenomena and also, about, and, and also death did not trouble us at all, and was never anything to us, and if we already knew about the limits of pains and desires and we didn't need to figure that out through science, then we would have no need of natural science, and there'd be no point in doing it. So we actually have a completely, as it were, instrumental view of why one should do natural science and why one should pursue physics, essentially to create human health, both the body the health of the body, which we need to know about physics and know about the nature of our bodies and so forth in order to relieve diseases and suffering of it, and also for the sake of the soul, which after all, according to this philosophy, is just another kind of body within a body, and, so, and it also has associated sufferings and pathologies. And these are mostly connected to concerns we have about the natural world what's caused it, whether it's um, got any message for us, and that sort of thing. But if we didn't have concerns about that, if we weren't worried and confused about this, these kind of things, there'd be no point in doing physics. But as it stands, we are plagued with worries about all of these things, and confusions about the true nature of pleasure, and so forth. And so we need to do some natural science. And at the beginning of the first letter that you read, or, or rather of the second letter that you read, he says, 
since this kind of method of investigating natural things is useful to all those who are concerned with the study of nature, I recommend constant activity in the study of nature. And with this kind of activity, more than any, I bring calm to my life. So the object of the philosophy is to bring calm and tranquility and relieve yourself of this anxiety that's plaguing you. And according to Epicurus, studying physics is actually the best way to do that. Not just because it provides you a distraction so you don't think about those other things that bug you, but it tells you something about the nature of reality that's actually reassuring and allows you to avoid some confusions and superstitions that plague life and make it less enjoyable. Okay, so that's about the overall division of the philosophy and what parts exist for the sake of others. Now, a little bit more about logic, and I'm, I've got one entire slide on logic only, which is about its, relevant, its relative significance in their philosophy. Logic or canonic, canonic the, study, the, the standard or measure which apprehends criteria that apply to basically three things. First, analysis of words in order to determine what, if anything, in reality they actually refer to. So, for example, the word table, does it actually refer to anything? Well, let's suppose we can all agree it refers to this kind of thing. Okay, so table isn't that controversial of a concept, but what about things like body, or empty, or void, or time, or pleasure, or glory, or virtue, or happiness? Some of these terms might not refer to anything that actually exists in the world, in which case we should eliminate them, not just from our vocabulary, but from our minds entirely. In other cases, they do correspond to something, but the objects that they correspond to are different than what we think they actually correspond to. And in some cases, they correspond exactly to what we think they do, and their relationship is in a way evident or obvious. The second use of logic is to use our sensations and feelings that we all have immediate access to as a basis for distinguishing things that are evident from things that are not evident. So, according to Epicurus, for example, it's evident that pleasure is a good thing. If you're wondering if it's a good thing, just feel some of it and you'll realize this is a good thing. Um, or it's even easier to demonstrate pain. You don't think pain's a bad thing? Let me show you how bad of a thing uh, it is. Um, but it's not evident where, where, whether something like um, glory or honor, is that a good thing? Maybe that's actually a bad thing. It's not evident whether it is. It's certainly not as obvious as something like pleasure. And finally, we use logic to make an inference of what is not evident from what is evident. So, for example, it's not evident that there is a bunch of empty space or void contained within this desk. But I can actually infer from things that are evident that there must actually be empty space in it, because it's actually permeable by certain kinds of substances and so forth, which could be demonstrated. And those things could be observed, and we could see those, and the only way we could explain those is that there must be hollows or pores or something within the table. Even though it's not immediately obvious to me, I can, I can infer it from things that must be. Okay, so let's start with um, the basic principles of the physics, and you all were quite right to correct me on, don't give us an atomistic picture of the universe like Descartes that doesn't have any void in it, because the universe consists of atoms and void, according to that. Uh, and those are the two basic principles of everything. And so actually the best representation of the universe that I can find that most resembles this picture is the actual image of the cosmic background radiation of our own universe. Because after all it consists of a bunch of void space and a bunch of space filled with bodies in greater or lesser amounts of density. Okay, but the actual starting point of the reasoning about this stuff is just the principle that nothing can be generated out of nothing. So nothing can just pop into existence out of nothing. And nothing can be completely destroyed so that 
it entirely disappears. You can break things up maybe into smaller and smaller units, but you can't break it up so much that all of the material basis for it completely disappears. And that should be familiar to you is something like the law of conservation of matter. In order to, to bring new things into existence, we need pre-existing material rearranged in some way, and in order to bring things out of existence, we reduce it back to these two smaller parts before it was um, assembled. But we never completely destroy anything, and we never create anything new. Furthermore, we assume that the totality of the universe is the same now as it ever was and ever will be. There's nothing outside of the universe, so there's no place from which it could change or nothing that could cause it to change in any fundamental way. All that can happen is that the things that exist within it become rearranged and juxtaposed into new and different recombinations. And this totality consists of bodies in motion through, as I said, void or empty space. And there is an infinite amount of void space and an infinite number of atoms. Okay, so a little more about bodies and void. The existence of bodies is evident through sense perception, like you've got one yourself and you can perceive a bunch of other bodies in here, and not just people's bodies, but inorganic uh, bodies. So I can see I've got some kind of bodies uh, here, and it's resistant to my touch. I cannot just see it, but I can hear it, I can feel it. I won't do this, but I can taste it uh, if I wanted to. And it's pretty obvious that there's a body that, yeah? I was, uh, back to the last slide, I was wondering, how do we know that atoms are infinite? Uh, let me get to that in a second after I introduce these. Good questions, but and also how do we know the void is infinite? Right. And it's, I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. But first of all, how do we even know there's bodies or void? And the point is that it is obvious or evident that there are bodies. To our very sensation, we can tell there are, there are bodies. Um, and every mode of sensation reveals there are bodies. In fact, sensation is just some sort of collision of bodies. Um, but the existence of void isn't evident. We don't see void, as it were. It's just empty space, but it can be inferred from the fact that there are bodies in motion. If there wasn't any void, then there wouldn't be any space for bodies to move in, and so everything would be immobile. But through our immediate sensation, we see that things are moving, so we know there must be void spaces that they're moving in. Therefore, we have exactly two basic principles, uh, body and void. Now, um, go back to this slide. Why do I say there's an infinite amount of void space and an infinite number of um, atoms? Well, one way to get at this is that we could talk about how we would limit the amount of void or the amount of atoms, and then how those two would exist together. Now, suppose there were an infinite number of atoms, but a limited amount of void space. Well, then that infinite number of atoms couldn't fit into that limited void space. If there was an infinite amount of void space, but a limited number of atoms, then in the fullness of time, all of those atoms would become dispersed in that infinite space, and none of them could combine into the kind of bodies that we see and that are visible. So if the two options are that void is either limited or unlimited, then it must be unlimited in order to accommodate um, atoms, but the atoms themselves must be um, infinitely many, or else um, eventually they would disperse in this infinite void space. Now, we can also um, realize that there can't be any limit on the overall universe because the idea of a limit depends on the idea of a kind of boundary, but a boundary only exists against some kind of backdrop. And so that backdrop itself has to exist in a sense, and if it exists, then it's part of the universe. So, um, so for example, if um, 
if I want to say the universe is limited, let's let's just take a simple case where it's where it's a circle or a sphere, okay, and then this is the limit of my universe, but how do I know that's the limit of my universe? Well, I said it was, but then it's against this background. So I can only see that that's a limit by realizing there's this background that it's set against, but then this background must exist in order for me to, to apprehend that limit. Furthermore, what happens if I tra travel <coughs> to the limit of this universe and then throw a sphere in this direction? Well, it either keeps going, in which case there's more void for it to enter, and I can apply that argument at any point, at any further point, and thus it must infinitely extend, or it hits up against a wall. But a wall is a three-dimensional object that there has to be a uh, certain depth to and a back side to, and um, that's either infinite or limited. If it's infinite, again, the universe is infinite. If it's limited, then it must have some other extremity or limiting point, and the same considerations apply. So it's just a matter of there, there's no sufficient way to limit the cosmos, or sorry, limit the universe. Cosmos is a different story. Worlds are a different story. But there's no way to, to limit the totality of everything. Yeah? So, did they think that like the soul was just a naturally occurring thing that... Yes, they did, but we're a long ways from talking about the soul. Because we haven't even talked about how atoms get combined to form anything, or how, much less, how a living thing could be understood to be a collection or a composite of atoms. So we're not, we're just not there yet. We're we're still just talking about the very basic, the most basic principles that must exist anywhere in the, in the universe. So I haven't, I haven't talked about how worlds, how heavenly bodies, how stars, how suns, how plants, humans, animals, um, minerals. I haven't gotten into how any of that exists. These are just the basic principles that will be necessary in order to explain any of that stuff. Yeah? The first and the last um, points sound sort of contradictory to me because you have an infinite number of atoms, but you can also say that nothing is created out of nothing. And so They're not they're not created. Right, they're not created, but where would they come from in the first place? If they're not created, but there's an infinite number of them. Yes. They well, where do they come from? They they come you mean like where did these atoms come from? Right. Right. They came from some other part of the cosmos that they that they flowed into. And so they've they've always the, the presupposition is that there's always been an infinite number, they've always been in constant motion in this infinite void. That's gonna be our basis for explaining everything else. And so it's a good question. Well, where did those come from, right? But the answer is that those didn't come from anywhere. Everything else comes from them. You see, not everything can have a cause. And that's because some things have to be causes. Okay? And so atoms and void don't have a cause that brought them into existence. Everything else that comes into existence is a result of their being in existence and there being a recombination of these. If we always had to say that everything that came into being always has some prior cause, then this will be a vicious infinite regression where we'll never be able to explain anything. Whereas this is not a vicious infinite regression, we're just positing there's an infinite number of entities and there's no reason to limit them, but they give us a handle on causal explanation. So I will, in theory, be able to explain how worlds, how heavenly bodies, how plants, animals, and humans come into existence by talking about recombinations of these principles, atoms and void. Okay, but they do not come into or go out of existence. And so they do not violate this law of conservation of matter. There's always exactly the same number of them, an infinite number. And there's always exactly the same amount of void, an infinite number. No new void comes into existence. Which, which you, you, it, it might be the case that new voids do come into existence. Like this, I, this crazy idea about the expansion of the universe. 
right? Which is actually a standard idea now. The Epicureans are wrong. The whole universe is, is expanding, which means there's more space between everything. Like, there's more space between you and me right now than there was a minute ago. That space has itself expanded. I mean, it's, it's too little for it to make much difference to us now. But in, in 100 billion years, even if we just remain stationary, space itself would increase, and we, we would end up further apart, according to this crazy modern theory. Okay? Now, that doesn't happen according to Epicureanism. Okay, new void doesn't come doesn't come in. New atoms don't come in. They might come into a specific isolated world, but they don't come into the universe as a whole. All right, other questions? I'm delighted with these 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 questions. This is what you should be asking. Now, the the void doesn't have any properties whatsoever, except unless you want to call a property that it always yields to a body passing through it. So it offers no resistance whatsoever to bodies. And atoms only have a couple of intrinsic properties. Size, shape, hardness, which just means they cannot be divided. They can't be cut up any further. If they could, they could be destroyed, and then you could destroy things into nothing, but that's impossible. So at some point, you destroy things enough, and you get down to the atoms or the indivisible entities that it consists of. And those atoms themselves only have size, shape, and weight, basically. Yeah? Does water have movement, or is it just atoms that have movement? It's just atoms that have movement through the void. The void is a condition for their for their moving, but it doesn't it doesn't um, exert influence or something on them. Now there is I did notice this morning we were reading this on the bus. There's a strange turn of phrase where he says they move because of the void, um, which makes it sound like somehow the void is providing a motive power for them to move. But that's not what he means. He means the void makes it possible for there to be motion, to, for there to be space in which they, they move. Okay? Now, according to Epicurus, and he differs, go, go ahead. Um, how did they come up with all these shapes of the atoms? Like, how do they know that atoms, like fire atoms, are triangles? Well, this goes back to Democritus as well, <laughs> who speculated about this. But, for example, fire is able to break up other bodies. Very and, and, and very much more efficiently than other things. So it must be it must have these points, be very pointed, and then so that it so that it can take even even small objects and drive them further apart, create larger voids between them. So then they, they, it must have the most pointed shape, and that's essentially a pyramidal shape. Um, whereas um, atoms of other things like of um, of smooth things or rapidly moving things must have a shape that is not uh, immobile like a cube, but is is more um, like a sphere because spheres move much more uh, quickly. Whereas immobile things like earth or stone or something must be made primarily of atoms that are sort of like cubical or something and that and that don't have a tendency to move. So they make extrapolations about what shapes, what various shapes they must have. Now, the most general thing they must say about shapes of atoms is that they, um, that they, are, they have such different shapes that they can become interlaced with each other and, and combined and connected with each other. If they were all spheres, that might not be possible. There's no way that they could become entangled. And so there wouldn't end up being any compounds. But since there are compounds of these, they must have, to some extent, interlocking shapes or an ability to interlock. And so what we, what, the main thing we need is hooked atoms, that these hooks can interact with, with sort of eyelet features on other kinds of atoms so that they become um, intertwined. Um, but we make inferences from sensible qualities, things, things like um, 
speed and smoothness and roughness and so forth to the kinds of atoms that the bodies are uh, made out of. And um, Democritus said there's an infinite variation in the shapes, but Epicurus changed the doctrine slightly and said there's an innumerable or uncountable many variations of shapes, but they aren't infinite, because he thought if you had an infinite variety of shapes, then you would have to have an infinite sizes, because you would get, there's only so many combinations that can fit into one size, and then so you would need bigger and bigger atoms, and eventually you would have, if, if you have infinitely many, you would have atoms that are the size of whole worlds, or you would have at least visible atoms, and the atoms themselves aren't uh, visible. So a little bit more about compounds. So some, some among bodies, some are compounds, some are simple. The simple ones are the atoms, the indivisible entities. So compounds are, consists of combinations of atoms, and so they are divisible, and we can break up these compounds, because we can break them up into their atoms. And we can assume degrees of complexity, not just atoms, but combina combining atoms into the, like molecular-like structures and mo molecular-like structures <coughs> in, into larger and larger structures and more and more complex structures. Compounds include um, everything we see in the world, all the artifacts like tables and chairs, all the plants, animals, etc., are compounds of atoms and void. Um, again, atoms can't be destroyed because if they could be destroyed, then everything could be destroyed, and in the fullness of time, nothing uh, would exist, and we would violate the laws of conservation of matter. Um, by the way, that diagram there, a bit hard to read the description, but was scientists taking an atom um, uh, 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 taking some iron and differentiating the, uh, t t taking some composite of a metal and then determining actual ratio of um, atom, uh, sorry, of iron and platinum atoms within it and making a, a sort of map of a compound of a, of a, of a chunk of metal consisting of those atomic elements and actually being able to diagram out how they recombined, something Epicureans certainly could not do. Okay, now I've already said the universe is unlimited or infinite in extension and given the reason for that, limitation implies extremity, etc. Um, I've already said that the universe consists of infinite number of atoms in an infinite void, and how there would be problems if you tried to uh, limit either of those. So the universe is infinite, everything else is uh, limited, and there are an infinite plurality of worlds, or cosmoi, which is the plural of cosmos, within the universe. All a world is, is a temporary envelopment of some atoms in a void space. And again, this can happen on any number of levels. We can have micro, uh, a microcosmos or a micro world on a, on a very small level. We can have very large and complex things that include entire, say, solar systems, galaxies, superclusters of galaxies, and even and possibly even larger uh, structures. And they speculate that some of these worlds are very similar to ours, some are very different. Some of them are lifeless, some of them have other living things, some of them have living things but not intelligent living things, others of them have intelligent living things. In fact, other, others of them will have things that look like humans, in fact, others of them will have things that look like humans a lot like us, humans sitting in a classroom studying something a lot like Epicureanism. And that's because since there's an infinite number of these worlds, every possible combination does occur somewhere. And then every possible variation on it must occur somewhere. So if, if, if you think it's really a bad problem that you're sitting here right now, you're actually sitting here in an infinite number of other worlds as well. But you're also doing an infinite number of other things in other places at other times, so if that's consolation for you, then good. Um, these worlds come into being 
and then go out of being like every other compound. Right? Our world is just happens to be this temporary envelopment and juxtaposition of atoms came into being at a certain point of time. Our star, the, the star that we're circling around came into being at a certain point of time. This planet came into being at a certain point in time. The moon came into being at a certain point in time. Animal life came into being on the planet at a certain point of time. And just as surely, all of it will uh, be broken up and disappear and dissipate into other um, regions of the universe and then recombine in other ways. Now, talking about basic causes of motion, okay? Yeah? How did they deal time? Well... Was it like linear or like circular? Um, they... basically neither. Um, they have a, an extremely presentist view of time. So, um, only what exists right now, in whatever period now is, which is, presents some difficulties. I should have asked Blythe about this. She just wrote a PhD thesis on it. But um, they, uh, things in the past and the future don't as such exist. Okay, so only, only present things really exist. Um, there's a lot more to be said about their theory of time, but in order to explain it, I have to explain their theory of motion, because time is related to their account of motion. So again, everybody's trying to jump ahead to tell me, explain how the world works, and how consciousness works, and how plants and animals work, but I haven't even explained to you how atoms move in this void yet. So let's, let's, let's comprehend that. So one cause of their motion is the fact that they have weight or gravity, and this is a, 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 an extremely problematic notion, actually, as it is for us. Nobody's figured out what gravity is yet. Um, but it, it's some kind of cause that makes bodies fall downwards and fall straight downwards. And you can observe this sensibly by doing things like dropping stones or dropping your pen and watching it travel straight in a downward line. That's the natural direction that everything tends to travel. Another cause of motion is that when atoms collide or combine, then they rebound and redound in different directions based on, based on the speed that they're moving and the shapes of the atoms involved and the angles of their collision, then they go off in all sorts of uh, directions and collide. But there's a problem. If all bodies are naturally moving straight downwards, then they're all moving in parallel lines. And so how could they ever combine? And if they don't ever combine, then no compounds are formed, and so no um, worlds, no planets, no living things, no humans, but we can see that all these things exist, so they must combine somehow. But how do they combine if the natural motion of everything is just to move straight downwards? When we drop a pen, we don't ever see it float upwards or, to, or sideways or something. So how do we get these? We have to posit that there's some other cause of motion. And this we call the swerve, that there's some kind of random or indeterminate motion that atoms make that we can't account for. Occasionally, one just swerves off this directly straight trajectory so that it can collide with other atoms, so that those atoms can become interlaced, and so that compounds can arise. So we have to posit that. Again, we can't explain the swerve. If you say, what's the principle of something swerving, I can't. I have to posit it in order to explain other phenomena like compound bodies um, and so on. Okay, so those are the three basic causes of motion. They have some sort of natural motion in a certain direction, which we conventionally call downwards. They have the various kinds of motion they make due to trajectories that happen as a result of them colliding. And then, in order to get collisions off the ground, we have to posit that there's some indeterminacy in this whole system so that we can't always predict, predict, 
uh, sorry, predict the trajectory of an atom, and we have to suppose that there is occasionally a swerve of atoms. Now, there must be questions about that point, the scandalous swerve, this uncaused motion that seems totally unreasonable and doesn't make any sense, and we would never believe anything like that there's indeterminacy in atomic motions, right? Um, we couldn't accept that that was possible. You must always be able to determine the space of an atom if you know enough about its direction and its shape and, and uh, trajectory and so forth, right? Well, no, it turns out there's, this, is actually, um, this actually turns out to be a thesis in our own contemporary physics, in quantum mechanics, that there, are, there is indeterminacy in any given physical system. Now, it is not clear for Epicureanism how often swerves have to happen. One, and, and almost every answer is defended in the scholarly literature. So, in, according to one theory, you only need one swerve to have ever happened in the entire history of the universe. That was enough to, to cause a chain reaction of colliding events that got the whole compound of atoms thing going. Another possibility is that swerves happen all the time. They're constantly happening. In fact, every time a human decision or something is made, there must be a swerve taking, taking a body off of its uh, straight uh, trajectory. Um, but that, that's a complexity we'll get into later. Yeah? With the advent of uh, quantum computing, aren't we able to better simulate environments to answer these theoretical questions? Like, aren't we doing things now that are better able to validate from like a more scientific, more actionable manner? Well, I hope so. I, I, I hope that after 25 years, 2,500 years, we can do it a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah, so the answer is yes. I think, I think we do have a better, more sophisticated theory of atomism, but we still have the a principle of quantum mechanics called indeterminacy. And no, we're not advanced enough that we've gotten over that. So we still essentially have a swerve in our atomic theory. We can't explain it. It's a phenomenon that must exist, but we can't, we can't explain it. In fact, we use it to explain other things. But yes, we, uh, the, um, these are all real pictures. That's a picture of an atomic collision, a simulation of an atomic collision happening in a particle accelerator. Okay? This is actually a map of atoms in an actual piece of metal, okay? Epicureans didn't have anything like this. They had words written down on paper based on, on just speculation about these things. They didn't have, they didn't even have microscopes or telescopes, okay? So the, the theory that there's something outside of the visible world that we can see, you know, Aristotle looks out at that and says, Oh, it's bounded by that set of fixed stars that always stays in the same relation to each other. There's nothing outside of that. You can't see anything outside of that. It would be totally irrational to think there's anything outside of that. Well, according to Epicureans, reasoning a bit differently, well, could it really be limited? What would be on the other side of it? What would happen if I went to the edge of it and threw a spear? And so forth. Reasoned that it must be infinite. Okay, now, um, by the way, the verdict on that's still out. Is it infinite or is it limited? Did it come into being in a certain point of time or didn't it? Like, none of that has been definitively answered. So, I mean, of course our physics has advanced, and I think it's advanced largely along these lines of Epicurean physics. Um, but it hasn't... Um, what, what's astounding is how much of this original version of the theory persists within the system, like unbelievably much, and, and so that it seems incredible that this could have been speculated about in antiquity, and yet it was. Uh, so we finally get to the, the burning question that everybody's having, how do we get a living things out of this? And the, the Greek form of that question is, how do you get a psyche out of that? Psyche meaning a principle that differentiates between a lifeless body like a stone and a living body like a plant or an animal. And the answer is that 
Um, souls are just kinds of bodies, certain configuration of extremely small interlaced um, atoms. There is some material recombination of things within a body which will animate that particular body. And so um, there is no uh, you know, sort of spirit or ghost or something that's within these bodies, because those don't exist. There's only atoms and void. And so, ultimately, the, the, the brain and everything else in the body, we, if we, if we um, analyze it enough and we break it up into its simpler components, ultimately we're just going to reach these atoms or subatomic particles or whatever, but eventually we're going to reach indivisible entities and living things are just really complex recombinations of those. So complex that Epicureanism doesn't have that much more of a story to tell about how we get living things out of that. But then again, neither does our physics. Still remains a problem we can't exactly answer. How do we get life out of inorganic entities? So, we've been trying to do it for a long time. In fact, there's lots of great research on this going on here at UCSD. Can we simulate environments that existed three billion years ago on Earth when life started evolving here? And so we put all these organic and inorganic, or we put these inorganic molecules together and we add electricity and so forth. We still can't do it. We still can't produce living things out of it. We can't explain how that happened. We have theories about how it happened, about how biogenesis happened, and they all are theories along Epicurean lines that certain kinds of atoms or complexes of atoms called molecules, RNA and so forth, combined in these primordial soups and eventually produce something living. But we are still unable to confirm that that is how life came into existence, and part of the problem is that the only place we've found that it ever existed is on this one particular uh, planet. So until we find it on some other one, we won't have anything to compare it to and it will be hard to say. Or it will be hard to say that it didn't, say, originate in some other part of the, of the cosmos and just traveled to here three billion years ago. Travel either randomly because some um, comet or something brought it, or deliberately that some other advanced civilization sent the basic biological material to our world that has enabled it to um, evolve since then. Um, sounds crazy, and I wish I could rule one of those theories out and say, here's exactly how life comes into being out of lifeless atoms, but we don't have that explanation. There isn't a satisfactory scientific explanation for that. But Nevertheless, we assume that something like that happened. Something like the Epicurean story must be on to the right thing, unless you want to think that it's through this panspermia scenario that it originated elsewhere in the cosmos. Of course, the Epicurean line of reasoning about that is, suppose it did originate somewhere else in the cosmos. Well, let's go there and then ask how it originated there. How did it get started there? Um, presumably through some kind of recombination of inorganic atoms in primordial soup or whatever. Um, otherwise, it got there because intelligent people put it together. But then the question is, how did they get there? And they must have got there through recombination of things that already existed, and so on. And so that, that answer that it originated somewhere else may or may not be true, but it doesn't get us to the basic question of, where does it come from, and why is, there, why is it there instead of not being there? Um, now, uh, one thing about living things and about the soul, the principle that makes some bodies alive and others not, <coughs> is that soul atoms can affect other bodily atoms, and bodily atoms can affect soul atoms. Um, and that is why they must all be conceived as some kind of body, because only bodies can affect other bodies. So I can affect these bodies in my hand by moving my hand, and so I'm moving bodies by uh, doing this. 
Um, I can also be affected by other moving bodies, like they could collide with me. And that's actually what's happening in um, sensation. Individual atoms, of course, aren't complex enough that they can be alive or they can sense. We have to assume these are very complex um, compounds of them. And, but when um, these complexes are destroyed or die, this is the reason you can't go on to sense anything after you die, because you don't have the right um, configuration or pattern of these atoms that make it possible either to be alive or to sense. Um, plants and animals, they have got an account that contains some elements of a theory of evolution. Um, living things are just recombinations of these more complex parts. These atoms combine to form these molecules. These inorganic molecules combine to form these organic molecules. The organic molecules combine in various ways that give rise to other things. In fact, things capable themselves of reproducing complex structures and taking other things like food from the environment and converting it into um, into things by means of which they can grow, reproduce, uh, etc. Um, and according to their theory, basically, they again have this combinatorial theory, every combination happens, has, 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 that's possible has happened in our world, but only some of these combinations are actually viable and able to survive. And among the combinations that are viable and able to survive are the plants and animals that have survived and are around. So it's, it's just by virtue of the fact that we are more able to survive in the environment that happens to have been uh, created that um, just because we have organs that happen to be adapted to allowing us to survive um, and the ones that weren't able to survive went extinct. That makes it look like somebody designed us to be very well adapted for this environment, but the fact of the matter is that we just got lucky that our combinations are able to survive in this environment, and many other, almost infinitely many other um, combinations that weren't able